Good evening. I call to order the meeting of the Board of Education of Baltimore County for Tuesday, August 25th, 2020. At this time, Baltimore County Public Schools and offices are closed to the public in order to maintain the health and safety of our students and staff. This evening's Board of Education meeting is being held virtually and broadcast through live stream on the BCPS website or on BCPS TV, Comcast Xfinity Channel 73, Verizon Fios Channel 34. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, we will use a roll call vote for all voting items and board members will say their names before discussion or, sec or making a motion, as well as when requesting any questions on an agenda item. May I have a motion to go into closed session as permitted by the Open Meetings Act as found in the Annotated Code of Maryland, General Provisions Article 3-305, B1, B7, and B9, to one, discuss the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom it has jurisdiction or any other personnel matter that affects one or more specific individuals. Seven, consult with counsel to obtain legal advice and nine, to conduct collective bargaining negotiations or consider matters that relate to the negotiations. May I have a motion? So move. Ken? Second, Thank Offerman. You. Thank you. May I have a roll call vote, please? Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Ms. Pastor? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Mr. Mahunza? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Clausy? Yes. Ms. Jost? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Thank you. Carries. Ms. Gover, can you? Good evening, this is Kathleen Causey. I now call to order the meeting of the Board of Education of Baltimore County for August 25th, 2020. I invite you to rise and recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. We will then take a moment of silence in honor of those who have served education in Baltimore County. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. In accordance with the mandated direction of the state superintendent, Baltimore County Public Schools and offices are currently closed to the public in order to maintain the health and safety of our students and staff. In accordance with the Board of Education's resolution approved at the March 10th, 2020 board meeting, in the event of a medical or health emergency related to COVID-19, the board chair, in consultation with the vice chair and the superintendent, may declare that a board meeting or a board committee meeting be held remotely in its entirety without the physical presence of board members, subject to the establishment of a mechanism that would allow each board member to fully participate in the meeting despite not being physically present, and that would allow the public to also remotely attend those portions of the meeting that are open pursuant to the Maryland's Open Meetings Act by being able to listen and or view those portions of the meeting. As a result, tonight's Board of Education meeting is being held remotely and broadcasted through live stream on our website, bcps.org, and on BCPS TV, Comcast Xfinity Channel 73, Verizon Fios Channel 34. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this, this evening will be done with a roll call vote and board members will say their names before initiating discussion or making a motion. Before we move on to the next agenda item, 
the board members have a short presentation for all students, parents, staff, and community members. And I turn it over to Ms. Cheryl Pasture. Thank you. In two weeks, schools open. If change is the end result of all true learning, then we have already gone back to school for we have had to change so much about ourselves and our lives and learned what is truly important. So board members, we say to each and every one listening, wake up everybody, it's a brand new day. Wake up, everybody. No more sleeping in bed. No more backward thinking. Time for thinking ahead. The world has changed so very much from what it used to be. There is so much sickness, hatred, war, and poverty. Wake up, all the teachers. Time to teach a new way. Maybe then they'll listen to what you have to say. Because they are the ones who are coming up, and the world is in their hands. When you teach the children, teach them the very best you can. The world won't get any better if we just let it be. The world won't get any better. We have to change it, all of us, just you and me. If change is the end result of all true learning, then we are embarking on a journey unlike any we have experienced. It won't be simple, it won't be easy, it is where we are. So wake up everybody, there's a big change ahead, no more time to fuss and fight, but working together instead. And in the words of that great American philosopher, LL Cool J, when adversity strikes, that's when you have to be the most calm. Take a step back, stay strong, stay grounded, and press on. So wake up, everybody. It's time to be calm. Take a step back, yes. Let's stand firm and strong. If change is the end result, result of all true learning, we are ready. We will persevere. We will come out of this better. We promise because our lives depend on it. To our children, parents, teachers, administrators, and all essential personnel at schools, on the grounds in central office, and especially you, Dr. Williams, for your leadership, we thank you. Together, we will teach our children. Wake up, everybody. It's a new day. There's a good change, good change ahead. ahead. Woohoo! We can do this. <laughs> Board members, can we do this? Woo! Yeah, woo! Yeah! Woo! Dr. Williams. <laughs> that was very nice, Board members. Nice surprise. <laughs> very good. Your views. <laughs> So I want to thank uh, our board member, Cheryl Pasture, for adapting the song, uh, Harold Melvin and the Blue Notes with singer uh, Teddy Pend Pend Pendergrass. So thank you very much for that. Um, our first uh, agenda item is consideration of the August 25th agenda. Uh, Dr. Williams, are there any adjustments to the agenda? Madam Causey, uh, I am not aware of any changes or additions to tonight's agenda. Thank you. The agenda stands as approved. I mean, as Ms. Causey, presented. This is Rod. This is Rod McMillian. I have a motion to make. Yes, Mr. McMillian. I move that the board that the Baltimore County Board of Education solicit an RFP for board legal counsel services through the BCPS Office of Purchasing following appropriate procurement guidelines. Madam Chair, this motion is but, out of order because it belongs in administrative function and was previously discussed. Um, Mr. 
Nussbaum, can I have a um, can I have a uh, ruling on Ms. Rose? Yeah, no, if, if it's a motion to amend the agenda, I think it's appropriate. It, it, this, this agenda item does not have to take place in administrative function. It may take place in administrative function. So if it's a motion to amend the agenda, I think it's appropriate. Ms. Um, Ms. Cozzi, this is Molly. If I could uh, have Mr. Rod, Mr. McMillian, amend his motion to add the topic to the agenda. Mr. McMillian, would you consider the amendment to add it to the agenda? Absolutely. So, All Mr. Right, McMillian, you. would you like to restate your motion? Sure. I'd like to add the following motion to the agenda. I move that the Baltimore County Board of Education solicit an RFP for Board Legal Counsel Services through the BCPS Office of Purchasing following appropriate procurement guidelines. Thank you. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Is there discussion related to adding this agenda item? Uh, if the person who made the motion has nothing to say, I do. I do. I'm sure I'll do. Mr. McMillian? Okay, as, at the end of the month, we do not have primary board counsel. And, and everything else, when there's more than $25,000 spent, we have a responsibility to go through the RFP process. So I don't know why we wouldn't do that and initiate it as soon as possible. Why would we wait another two weeks and then that turns into another two weeks? We have the experts within our system that can answer these questions and, and take care of this matter this evening. Thank you. And it's taxpayers' dollars that we're talking about. Thank you. Thank you. Other board members? Ms. Rowe? Yes, thank you, Ms. Causey. Um, I don't believe that at any point in time we decided that we were not going to issue an RFP, but there remains questions concerning the process, questions which we have agreed, I believe, to set on a um, future administrative function agenda. And since this is an administrative function issue, I don't believe that it belongs on the agenda for tonight's open session meeting. Ms. Causey, if I may. Um, this is Molly. Mr. Nussbaum, the board's legal counsel, just reiterated that it can be held, it can be added to the agenda, so there's no need for it to be in the administrative session. To reiterate what Mr. McMillian said, these are taxpayer dollars. It is a six-figure contract at all his um, motion is asking is that the Office of Purchasing go through the proper protocol and guidelines to procure a board legal counsel for the board for fiscal 2021. And I don't see why, since it's taxpayers' dollars in keeping um, with transparency and also making sure that we did not give an impression of impropriety at the board, uh, it's important that we move forward with getting the Office of Purchasing to um, procure this or at least go about it to start initiate the process and bring it back to the board. Other board members before we vote to add an agenda item? Ms. Gover, could you call the roll call vote? Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? No. Ms. Pasteur? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Mr. Mahonza? Yes. Ms. Hen? No. Ms. Clausey? No. Ms. Jost? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Mack? No. Ms. Scott? Yes. Ms. Rowe? No. The vote in favor is seven. Thank you. So Just a moment while we, um, Ms. Gover, uh, select this position for it. We don't have buildings and contracts. Uh, Do you want to put it under new business action taken in closed session? Ms. Causey? Um, no, I don't think that's appropriate. Yes? Um,
Ms. Causey? Excuse yes. me. Mm -hmm. I just want to clarify, add a new item below new business action taken in closed session and before negotiation team. Ms. Causey? Um, Ms. Rowe? Are we going to need to close session to seek legal advice of counsel on this agenda item? Because I don't believe that I could make any decision on it without the advice of counsel. And um, we have counsel present, I believe, and there are legal questions which, due to personnel matters, cannot be asked in open session. Ms. Kazi, can we get board counsel to weigh in on it? Because I, we're not going to be discussing personal matter. This motion is simply to ask the Office of Purchasing to start the procure, initiate the procurement for getting primary board legal counsel. We're not discussing. We do not have the contract in front of us. We're not discussing negotiating. The appropriateness or, of getting having a school system um, employee personnel seek the board counsel for the board there are legal questions pertaining to whether or not their involvement and to what degree is appropriate or whether that presents a conflict of interest. And I have legal questions about this. So you could have clearly asked that in Ms. administrative session. Mr. Nussbaum, could you please me, wait? Excuse me, it wasn't on the me. agenda in administrative session, so no, I couldn't. <laughs> excuse me, we're yes, not it was. It was on the agenda. Excuse me, it is inappropriate to discuss administrative function. It is entirely inappropriate to discuss administrative function at this point. Um, Ms. Gover, please uh, adjust the agenda to uh, put the item at the end, um, and we will uh, start with a recess for legal advice just before that agenda item. So we can put that as item L. No, excuse me, item M. Do you mean item N after announcement? Um, yes, thank you for that. Um, Ms. Excuse Pauzi, me, Ms. So, Scott, are we finished with this agenda item? Yes, we are. Um, so I just wanted to clarify that in accordance with board policy 8314, there needs to be a majority vote of the board to add or remove an item from the agenda. So that item was approved. Uh, the next this item. is Ms. Scott. I wanted to yes. add an item to the agenda, if I may. Um, oh, uh -huh. I wanted to get an update or just have a discussion on basketball rims at BCPS schools, as well as device distribution, um, I guess the timeline for that for um, BCPS students. I second it. Thank you. Um, Ms. Scott, do you wanna to speak to your motion to amend the agenda? Yes, thank you. Um, I was thinking we could add it um, after item I. What I was looking at is that there are, um, and we've had discussion with community members and others, basketball rims that are installed at BCPS schools in um, certain districts or in certain areas, and then it's not evenly, um, they're not evenly uh, installed across all BCPS schools. So I wanted to um, have a discussion about that. Um, and then secondly, also about the device distribution for students who do not have devices or are entering high school or or entering in the system if we could also um get an update from the staff as to when those students would be receiving their devices so it's sort of like a, a calendar timeline thank you okay thank you for that miss scott and i see dr williams ha would like to make a comment dr williams so good afternoon, board members. I would just like to make a request based on what Ms. Scott offered. Uh, our team is working on some next steps related to those two items, as well as additional items that we know we need to provide some updates. So I would like to offer that we provide an update to the board and then we can provide some update to our public via our website or any other communication that we can provide at this time. 
I know there's there's several areas that our community and our staff would like some updates. Um, we are working through these items as quickly as possible. And so I would just like to request that we'll provide an update directly to the board and then we'll update our community regarding at least these two items, the basketball rims and the devices distribution. Ms. Scott, given Dr. Williams' comments, would you, uh, if that's, if that'll fulfill your um, request for this information, uh, would you like to withdraw your motion or proceed? Yes, I can withdraw my motion. Um, and I guess we can uh, hear that, follow up, and then have it uh, discussed at a later board meeting. Thank you. And we would need your second to uh, agree to the withdrawal of the motion. That, who was that? Hi, it was Russ Kean. Our next meeting isn't until after school starts, correct? That's correct. That is correct, yes. So I understand that he may not want to. <laughs> I mean, I'll withdraw it, um, Nikita. I was supporting your motion because I thought important and, um, you know, folks need to fully understand when those devices are going to be available um, and uh, the basketball rims is something that's been discussed. So I, I will withdraw it if that's your wish. Thank you, Russ. And Dr. Williams, we will look forward to that um, uh, information. So, yes. so just to clarify, um, Ms. Scott and Dr. Williams, so there will be uh, information updated to the board and then also be uh, community information. Is that correct, Dr. Williams? That is correct. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, hearing nothing else, the agenda stands as amended. Earlier this evening, the board met in closed session pursuant to the Opens Meetings Act for the following reasons. To one, discuss the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom it has jurisdiction or any other personnel matter that affects one or more specific individuals. Seven, consult with counsel to obtain legal advice. And nine, to conduct collective bargaining negotiations or consider matters that relate to the negotiations. The minutes of the closed session and informational summary can be found on our website at www.bcps.org slash board slash informational dash summaries dot html. The next item on the agenda is new business fiscal year 2021 negotiation teams. And for that, we call forward Ms. Lowry and Mr. Duke. Uh, Ms. Causey, did you wanna handle the personnel matters first? Ms. Lowry, thank you. Um, I had scrolled too far. Um, no problem. Thank you, Ms. Lowry. If you could please pre present Good evening, Chairwoman Causey, Vice Chairwoman Hen, Superintendent Williams, and members of the board. I would like the board's consent for the following personnel matters, retirements, resignations, recognition of deceased. Do I have a motion to approve the personnel matters as presented in exhibits D1 through D3? So moved, Mac. Do second, I have a second, Offerman. Thank you, Mr. Thank Offerman. Is there any discussion? May I have a roll call vote, please? Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kim? Yes. Ms. Pasture? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Mr. Mahomza? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Joe? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Ms. Rao. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. The motion carries. The next item on the agenda is administrative appointments. And for that, we call on Dr. Williams. 
Madam Chair and members of the board, I would like to bring forward for your approval the following administrative appointments. Assistant Principal at Perry Hall Middle School, Assistant Principal at Woodlawn High School, Executive Director, School Support Secondary, all zone, ERP Infrastructure Engineer, Division of Business Services, Department of Administrative Services, and Pupil Personnel Worker in the Office of School Climate, Pupil Personnel Services, and Responsive Student Programming. Do I have a motion to approve the administrative appointments as presented in Exhibit E1? So moved, Matt. Thank you. Do I have a second? Second, Harry. Thank you. May I have a roll call vote? Oh, excuse me. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, may I have a roll call vote? Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Thatcher? Yes. yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Mr. Mahomza? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Cloudy? Yes. Ms. Jost? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Ms. Rao? Yes. Thank you. The motion carries and we call on Dr. Williams for the recognition. So thank you. Our first candidate is Lauren Savage, assistant principal at Perry Hall Middle School. She brings 13 years of experience in Baltimore County Public Schools. Currently she's the teacher of mathematics at Windsor Middle, Windsor Mill Middle School. And she's also served in the Aspiring Leaders Program in 2015. Congratulations, Lauren Savage. Our next appointment is Robin Bomar, assistant principal at Woodlawn High School. She is new to Baltimore County Public Schools. We welcome you. She's coming from Hartford County Public Schools where she served as a classroom teacher, assistant principal at Joppa Town High School Center for Opportunity Alternative Ed Program, as well as Edgewood High School. Uh, she served as an instructional support teacher and classroom teacher uh, at Lake Clifton Eastern High School in Baltimore City Public Schools, at Doris Johnson High School in Baltimore City Public Schools, and at Thurgood Marshall High School. We welcome Robin Bomar. Congratulations. Next is Mildred I. Charlie Green, Executive Director, School Support Secondary, Office of the Community Superintendent, East Zone. She also is new to Baltimore County Public Schools. We welcome you, Ms. Charlie Green. Currently, she is serving as the principal at Northwood High School. She served as the principal of Tacoma Park Middle School. She has had several positions, such as assistant principal, academy coordinator, English resource teacher, literacy coach, reading and English teacher, and sixth grade teacher at Walker Jones Elementary School in the District of Columbia. She also served as a managing editor. We welcome Ms. Mildred Charlie Green. Our next appointment is Russell Hawkins, ERP Infrastructure Engineer in the Division of Business Services. He's coming from the ERP Infrastructure Engineer and Forces Incorporated. He has served as the Information Systems Manager. Also, he has served in 16 years supporting in the role of Senior Systems Engineer, Systems Engineer, System Source, and the Marketing Professional in the George D. Hall Company. Congratulations, Russell Hawkins. And our last appointment is Ayana Mu Young, pupil personnel worker in the Office of School Climate. She is new to Baltimore County Public Schools, so we welcome you. Currently, she serves as the chief consultant in I Am Empowerment, where she served over five years, president and lead trainer in incredible schools, Close to four years, she served as a school support liaison in Baltimore City Public Schools, a pupil personnel worker in Prince George's County Public Schools, as well as a peer mediation teacher at Decatur Middle School in Prince George's County. She's also served as a community super, as a community's uh, supervision officer in the U.S. federal government, court services, and offender 
supervision agency close to nine months. Welcome aboard, Ms. Ayana Mu Young. That concludes the appointments. Thank you, Dr. Williams. The next item on the agenda is public comment. The members of the board appreciate hearing from interested citizens. Because the board is meeting virtually for today's meeting, only written public comments can be accepted. Comments may be emailed to boe at bcps.org, which will be distributed to Board of Education members, and it is also attached to our board docs. Public comments requested to be published publicly and received before 11.59 p.m. the day before the meeting are attached. The members of the board uh, appreciate hearing from our community members and parents and families, and as appropriate, we will refer your concerns to the superintendent for follow-up by his staff. The next item on the agenda is item G, action taken in closed session. And Mr. Nussbaum, I uh, believe that there was no action taken this evening. I don't, rec I don't believe there was any action taken in closed session either. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is item H, new business, fiscal year 2021 negotiation teams. And for that, we'll ask Ms. Lowry and Mr. Duke to present. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Causey. I will yield to Mr. Duke. Good evening, Madam Chair, Vice Chair Hen, Dr. Williams and members of the board. This evening, I am seeking the board's consideration and approval of the proposed teams that will represent the Board of Education in the fiscal year 22 negotiations with AFSCME, CASE, ESPBC, OPE, and TAPCO collective bargaining units. Board members, do I have a motion to approve the fiscal year 21 negotiation teams as presented? So moved, Offerman. Is there a, Mac. Thank you. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, may I have a roll call vote? Dr. Hager? Yes. yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Pesture? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Mr. Mahomsa? Do I vote on this matter? Mm -hmm. Ms. Hemp? Okay, yes. 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 Ms. Hemp? Ms. Hemp? Did you say abstain? Correct. Thank you. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Jost? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. The motion carries. The next item on the agenda is consideration of the proposed revisions to the 2020-2021 school calendar. And for that, we have Mr. Duke again. Madam Chair and members of the board, the following revisions to the current school calendar for the 2020-2021 school year are being recommended. The removal of the entry designating September 4th, 2020 as orientation for students entering grades six and nine from the calendar. Not showing on your calendar, but also needing to be removed is the parenthetical uh, statement um, for the entry on September 10th, indicating that transportation begins the third uh, recommended change is adding the designation of Indigenous Peoples Day to October 11th, uh, which will accompany the designation uh, of Columbus Day. The redesignation of the Wednesdays preceding the end of the first and second quarter, which are Friday, November 13th and Friday, January 29th in the first semester as half days for students. These half days would be used for teachers for grade reporting and data analysis. The half days would be November 11th, 2020 and January 27th, 2020. The end of the quarters would remain unchanged. This would allow the end of the quarter half days to coincide with the remote instruction scheduled half day Wednesdays 
and thereby would have no further impact and reduction of the total number of student contact hours. Also being recommended is the discontinuation of the identification of President's Day and Easter Monday holidays as contingency closure makeup days. These days would be observed as public school holidays. The use of these holidays as contingency makeup days has a fiscal impact on the school system because we are required to pay AFSCME and ESPBC represented employees who work on these days time and a half in holiday pay. In the 2019-2020 school year, this represented an expenditure of approximately $350,000. Also, we are recommending that two emergency closure days be added to the end of the school year to allow the school system to have five closure makeup days. In accordance with COMAR 13A.02.0204, paragraph C, school year calendars must have a minimum of three emergency closure days to make up school days lost due to inclement weather or other emergency closures. Should no, should no emergency closures impacting instruction occur, the calendar be, would be contracted and a new end of school year date identified. Also, I would like to note that in discussions with the unions, it has been agreed that unless a state of emergency were declared by the governor, remote instruction could take place should the school system's work day be delayed or in-person operations be suspended due to inclement weather. If this is approved, appropriate language to this effect can be incorporated into the respective MOUs being finalized with each of our collective bargaining units. That concludes my comments. Uh, I will answer any questions that you may have. Board members, discussion? I see Mr. Kuhn's hand. Thank you, Ms. Fossey. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Dukes, just for clarification on the last point, you basically said unless the governor declares a state of emergency during this remote learning time frame, there will be no closures of school, correct? Basically, our closures in the past have been um, due to transportation requirements or have been associated with transportation requirements, um, and they've been affect they've um, been normally either on uh, delayed entries or uh, actual school closures because of snow. In a remote learning environment, uh, unless there is a large amount of snow that impacts um, electrical power or um, uh, access to the internet, um, virtual uh, learning can, can still take place. And just so I'm clear, the days that have been added to the end, the 23rd, the 24th, and the 25th, that would be, in essence, um, not the case if we if we didn't experience any of the the uh, the days that you are making space for, basically in the calendar. Is that accurate? Correct. If there are no inclement closures or inclement weather closures or emergency closures, then we would contract the calendar by the number of days that were unused. Uh, and we would end the school year uh, earlier than it is um, showing on the calendar at the present time. And then <clears throat> one final question I have regarding the number of pupil days. So you're showing 186 to 187 pupil days. What is the state mandated, mandated requirement? The requirement is 180 days. The number that you just quoted include the inclement weather days, which either will be used or uh, will be contracted. So we have six to seven inclement weather days built into the No, we have 100. Basically, the calendar is based on, uh, is built on 181 days. Um, and then plus the you know, five inclement weather days would give us the 186. All right. Thank you. And I'm not sure the order here, but uh, Mr. Mahamza? Yeah. Hi. Um, for the calendar uh, for the October Christopher Columbus holiday, is that replacing it with Indigenous the Indigenous Peoples Day, or is it uh, staying the same? Like, are they just combining both? 
It's in addition to Columbus Day, uh, the, the uh, Columbus Day annotation. Okay, uh, and I just wanted to make a comment. Um, I I intend not to vote on this calendar specific to uh, to that part, the keeping the Christopher Columbus Day. I just can't, as a person who, who comes from a history in a country where it endured genocide, uh, support a holiday that celebrates a man that um, historically subjugated uh, the Native American people. I just cannot, in faith, vote for a calendar that supports this man, uh, glorifies him, or memorializes him. So I intend to vote no. Uh, and I don't want to make a motion to change that, is because you guys diligently uh, made this calendar. I'm sure you met multiple times, but I just cannot vote for this calendar because of that reason. Thank you. And I'm just going to move across the screen as I see hands. So, um, Lily Rowe. Um, hi. So, the question I have is about the days that are added to the end. So, if we were to go back to school in session in January, which is a possibility, then we could have snow days. And then, in that case, we would be opening um, for those three days. What was the reason that we did not keep the second half of the calendar the same as originally approved? Um, basically, the fiscal the fiscal impact that uh, maintaining the President's Day and the Easter Monday holidays as contingency makeup days was the um, basis for the recommendation to the board, especially now that we're in a pandemic situation with. Um, um, the fiscal uh, strain that that, as well as the budgetary concerns that we have, we thought that it would be a prudent recommendation to reconsider using those days since it would cost the system additional funds. If we were to use both President's Day and Easter uh, Monday, that could equate to uh, approximately seven hundred thousand dollars additional. What is the fiscal impact of adding three days to the end of the school year? There, assuming well, that we're meeting in person. Obviously, there's the impact from maintaining the school facilities open, but as far as paying additional um, employees additional money in the form of time and a half, there would be no such expenditure. So we pay time and a half for those holidays and not for the three days at the end of the year. Is that correct? Correct. Okay, thank you. I would also like to just um, to back up a little bit. Uh, the reason that the Columbus Day uh, annotation is being maintained because that is currently in state law, and I do, I do not believe that we would be able to remove that from our calendar. Thank you, Mr. Duke. And um, let's see, Dr. Hager. Yes, thank you. Um, I just wanted to build off of some of the comments that Ms. Rowe had. Um, I appreciate that you are discussing with uh, the various groups involved that it, you know we could go to an online, uh, because we're in an online schooling situation, that that wouldn't count as a snow day. Um, have you kind of revisited all the possibilities for the spring semester? I'm trying to be very optimistic that we will be in school in some way in the spring, but if there is a hybrid model, um, is that included in kind of your contingency planning for snow days uh, during the spring semester? I'm not quite sure I understand um, the the objective of your question. If it's relative to um, conducting uh, remote instruction um, in the second semester, is that is that what you're so if, if we're in a hybrid model in the spring semester and there's a snow day, oh, is that going to be included in your contingency planning that we could still ca have school on a snow day, but it would be remote? No, that was not taken into consideration. We did not take into consideration the, uh, a hybrid model in the second semester. Um, basically, what this calendar is um, assuming is that we would probably return to um, brick and mortar and instruction in the second semester, hopefully. Thank you. Ms. Mack. Um, thank you, Ms. Causey. Mr. Duke, um, when I look on the calendar specifically for the Wednesdays, like uh, November the 11th, which is Veterans Day, 
it says that elementary and middle schools are closing three hours early for grade reporting and data analysis and high schools in session full day teachers on duty am i correct though that wednesdays are still as we speak right now designed for asynchronous perhaps small group instruction Currently, that is the case. Uh, however, on those two days, um, if this were to be approved, those days would be used um, for the grade reporting and data analysis. How about for middle and high school? Oh, I'm sorry, elementary and middle is grade reporting. How about for high school? A high school, uh, the, the school would be in session and um, there, uh, there would no be there would be no time allotted for the the uh, teachers to um, deal with the grade reporting and data analysis. Is, it would be it would be a normal half day Wednesday for the high school teachers. It says high schools in session full day. Teachers on duty. Correct. So is it a half a day for high schools or a full day? It's, a, it's according to the calendar, it's full day. And, uh, but again, because we have designated Wednesdays as asynchronous instruction, it potentially could not be every student on a Wednesday. It could be students who were involved in small group instruction. Is that correct? And that's correct. And does that make a difference in the hours that each student needs to fulfill no. the state requirement? No, because uh, the, 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 it's still a half day for, um, for middle and high, I mean, for elementary and middle, and a full day for, for uh, the high school. So it would still count as a, a student day. Okay, thank you. Ms. Hen. Thank you. Mrs. Kazi, would now be an appropriate time for a motion? Yes, Ms. Hen. You would entertain a motion. Thank you. I move that the board um, restore the two emergency closure makeup days, February 15th and April 5th, adjusting the end of the calendar accordingly. Dr. Grow. Thank you. Ms. Hem, would you like to speak to your motion? No, I think the motion speaks for itself. That was the original calendar that the board had approved. Okay, um, other board members with discussion? E excuse me, I'm having a technical issue here. Um, Ms. Hen, I know you have a motion on the floor. Could I have um, Ms. Rowe um, just handle this for a few minutes while I need to restart? Um, you want me to chair the meeting or Julie's chairing the meeting? No, just ad address this issue. Or, Ms. Hen, can yes, you address this issue sure. while you have your motion? There's a motion and a second. Ms. Joes, your hand is raised. Would you like to speak? No, I'm good. Thank you. Oh, okay, sure. Would anyone else like to comment on this motion before I call a roll call vote? Yeah. Mr. Kuhn? I uh, just to follow up with something, uh, Mr. Dukes. Um, by we, we you talked about extra cost associated with um, uh, dedicated if if those days are actually going to be in session days because of a makeup day in the middle of the year. My question to you is: You said that everyone would be paid time and a half based on their contract. But then my, my question for you is, um, 
you said it would be an extra three hundred fifty thousand dollars approximately now is that the because we're gonna we're gonna pay for the days regardless of whether or not it's on a holiday or at the end of the school year added on in june so is the half because we're talking time plus a half is the plus one half of a day three hundred fifty thousand dollars approximately the cost the, the cost to the system for president's day in 2020 was 350,000 additional dollars in salary so if we were in a position where both days were to be used we're talking about a, a plus $700,000 spend approximately yes thank you Thank you, Mr. Mahamza. Yeah, I was just asking, can you restate your motion again, Ms. Hassan? Sure, my motion is to restore the two emergency closure makeup days, um, February 15th and April 5th. Okay, and did you explain why? Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering. And those were the original um, dates in the calendar that the board had originally approved. And then also included in my motion was adjusting the end of the school year so that the two dates, June 24th and 5th, um, 24th and 25th, excuse me, would not be um, needed as makeup dates because those two days were placed in the calendar as emergency makeup days. Yeah. Um, I'm Thank just wondering, you. can staff comment on this? Is um, What do they think? So I believe your question was, you were asking for staff to comment on that? Yeah, I just want to know um, what changes would happen with this. Uh, sorry. No, and I believe Mr. Duke had, had commented on that. Mr. Duke, would you mind summarizing again for Mr. Mahamza? Well, basically, what would happen is that those two holidays would be um, restored as holidays and not as contingency days. One of the things that also has to occur uh, when we use either of those two holidays as uh, makeup days, we have to submit a request to the Maryland State Board of Education uh, for a waiver to use those days as student days. Um, well, that also puts, um, puts an added uh, proce uh, process into um, the final determination as to whether those days will be used as student days. Um, normally, the board, the state board, will approve it, but it's not 100% guaranteed. Um, <clears throat> I, I don't know if that answers your question or if you need additional information. No, that answers it. It's just I missed your part. Uh, okay. Ms. Hatton, can I speak to the second? Yes, I'm looking at hands. There are multiple hands raised. Um, before Ms. Rose speaks, did anyone else have their hand raised who has not spoken? I, Mr. Kuhn, you had your question um, answered. Mr. Mahamza, I'm just seeing if there are any other hands raised. Okay, Ms. Rowe, go ahead. So I seconded this because I thought we should deliberate on it. And the reason I thought we should deliberate on it is because if we go back in brick and mortar and we follow this candle calendar and we don't restore the dates and there are snow days, then the end of the school year could be considerably later. And we had a large number of people um, providing feedback on Facebook that this could create problems for different plans people have already made. Summer camps that start in that last week of June. And so that was my reasoning and I just wanted to clearly state that consideration. Thank you, Ms. Rowe. Um, Mr. Mahamza, your hand is still raised. Are you, did you have another comment no, or question? Sorry, I forgot to read. Uh, put it down okay thank you and i will just um speak one last time to to my motion to miss rose point um that adding days to the end of the calendar particularly when individuals have made plans has been problematic um, for individuals in the past the feedback that the board has received is that as miss rose stated 
that does cause conflict with summer plans, um, both vacations of staff, of families, of students, and so that making um, changes is problematic. And feedback that we've received since these changes have been um, published has has leaned strongly towards um, maintaining the current emergency closure makeup days, which prompted me to make this motion. So that being said, and seeing no other hands, um, Ms. Gover, may I have Ms. a Hen, this is Rod. Ms. Hager has a question. I say something? Um, yes, I saw Dr. Hager had her hand up and Mr. McMillian, mm -hmm. did you also wanted to speak to this motion? Yes, please. Sure. Go I can wait up for Dr. Hager. Oh, okay, Dr. Hager. Um, I just wanted to point out that you know these are our potential days, not not days added to the calendar that are are definite, and they're the end of the week days. I think that um, you know as as a parent, the challenging times have been when, when Mondays and Tuesdays have been added at the end of the year, but we're looking at adding you know Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, which is the end of a full week. And given the fiscal implications of um, you know should there be snow days, having those be on holidays, I, I think to me it makes sense to um, to approve the the calendar as presented tonight. Thank Wait, you. Uh, Ms. Ms. Hager, sorry. you said you support the amendment, or sorry, I missed. No, the the, the way that it, the the well, the changed calendar that is presented tonight, not the amendment to go back to the old calendar. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Hager. Mr. McMillian. Yes, I think seven hundred thousand dollars is a lot of money to spend on, you know, overtime or a time and a half on those days. So I'm against spending $700,000 for that. I think we can find a better way to spend our money. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I see Ms. Causey's hand raised. So Ms. Causey, you have returned and I will give the floor back to your, the gavel back to you. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Hen. Um, yeah, and I appreciate you uh, filling in as I had to address <laughs> technical issue here. Um, so my comment doves, dovetails with um, Dr. Hager and, and Mr. McMillian um, in looking closer at it. There is a concern with the additional funds uh, that may be required. Um, additionally, there has been uh, considerable concern, especially around the President's Day um, when people also make plans, um, having that three-day holiday. And um, I just also wanted to suggest, we'll be finishing our virtual semester on January 29th, and um, that that three-day weekend, if that's a, a known, that might be um, a nice time for teachers and staff to know that they have uh, three days off um, adjacent to the end of the first uh, semester. So um, while I understand your uh, concerns about the length of the week, um, I think those other concerns would, would have me not support that. Are there other board members with comments? Ms. Hen? Thank you. Yes, I would like to withdraw my motion, Mrs. Causey, based on board members' comments. The second approves. The, Actually, it, Ms. Causey, I'm sorry, it's Ms. Howie. Uh, yes, the Ms. motion's Howie. been made and seconded and discussed at length. It is now the, um, the property of the assembly, so the assembly would have to agree that it be withdrawn. Okay, thank you. Um, alternatively, we could just call. We could just call for the vote. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Any other discussion? Hearing none, Ms. Gover, if you could do a roll call vote on Ms. Hen's uh, proposed amendment. Dr. Hager. No. Mr. Kuhn. No. Ms. Pasture. No. Mr. Offerman? No. Mr. Mahonza? No. Ms. Hen? No. Ms. Causey? 
No. Ms. Joe? No. Mr. McMillian? No. Ms. Mack? No. Ms. Scott? No. Ms. Rouse? No. Thank you. So board members, is there additional conversation on the revised school calendar before we have a vote on that? Were there other questions or comments? Ms. Causey, is there a motion on the floor regarding that? No. I move to accept the calendar proposed by staff. Is there a second? Second, Offerman. Thank you. Hearing no additional discussion, we'll have the roll call vote, please. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Pasteur? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Mr. Mahomza? No. Ms. Hamm? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Jost? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. The motion carries. The next item on the agenda is item J, work session on the fiscal year 2022 state capital budget. For that, we call forward Dr. Scriven, Mr. Saris, and Mr. Dixit. So good evening, Madam Chair, Vice Chair, Dr. Williams, and members of the board. During our August 11th, 2020 board meeting, we provided you with the final approved FY 2021 county capital budget, and additionally the two state capital budget request for the board's review. Today, uh, now that you've had an opportunity to review the, those two documents and submit questions, I am joined by Mr. Pete Dixit, Executive Director, Department of Facilities Management, and Mr. George Saris, Executive Director, Department of Fiscal Services, who will facilitate tonight's work session. So Mr. Dixit, Mr. Saris. Thank you, Dr. Scriven. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay. Good evening, Chair Ms. Causey, Vice Chair Ms. Hen, Dr. Williams, and members of the board. Tonight, Mr. Saris and I will be sharing some of the details of the submission uh, of FY 2022 State Capital Program. Uh, before we go into this, I will just share a little bit of background for the benefit of new members that may not have as much experience with the capital program as some of the experienced board members have. The construction of schools uh, and major systemic work is funded through capital pro program and capital programs, the funds for those programs are raised by state and county through general obligation bond. Amount of total bonds that a government entity can raise is restricted by its affordability. So for us, there are two separate cycles. One is the state cycle. The other is the county cycle that move in different directions in the beginning, but in the end they meet. So tonight what we are presenting to you is a state portion of the capital improvement plan. So just to clarify, uh, some of the things that we want to know is our needs are far greater than what are included, than what's included in this capital program. The current state share exceeds $250 million for our projects. And just to give you magnitude of scale, in an average year, state provides us 35 to $45 million for their share of the capital program. 
for these projects to be funded fully by the state, it'll take several years at that rate to meet, to meet that $250 million. County has committed its support for the construction projects that are up to priority order 14 in your request and the complete design of Lansdowne High School. Any other projects will be guided by the effort of the multi-year plan, which is underway right now. And this request for submission to state has nothing to do at this time, at this point of time, by the development of the multi-year plan. In future, those projects or recommendations will be discussed in detail with the board, with the administrative committee, and with the members of the community, community before being added to the capital program. This request that you have in front of you is continuation of the previous year's plans. I will go over some of the changes that we have made here and the rationale behind it. The, pro the previous year's um, guiding principles were adding seats, air conditioning of projects, and improving infrastructure of schools. And that philosophy continues for, for this plan for fiscal 22. After that, I'll give you the background on the changes that we have made. So you have two attachments that Dr. Scriven talked about. One is the complete plan that was approved for fiscal year 21. And the other is the proposed plan that we are going to submit for your approval and then to the, uh, to the state for fiscal year 22. There are a lot of numbers in there so to make it simple, I would like to focus your attention for the priority of the project so that once you understand, then we can answer any questions you have on the numbers. So the first thing is that in the last year's plan, priority one, which was Berkshire Elementary, priority two, which was Colgate Elementary, and priority three was Chadwick Elementary. Those projects have already received full funding from the state and have been removed from the submission that you have in front for fiscal year 2020. The one of the change that we have made is change the priority of Red House Run Elementary School, which was priority 14 and 15. It has been moved to priority number two and three. The rationale behind this change has been made to enable one redistricting effort for the pair of schools. So we have combined Northeast Elementary in one cluster and Northwest schools, which is Bedford and Summit. They, they are together. So there are two main reasons for changing those priority. One is to limit the redistrict, redistricting study once and relocation of student once. And the second is that the crowding problem in the Northeast in the elementary school area is a lot more serious than the crowding problem in the Northwest area. The other change that has been made that County made the commitment for fully funding Lansdowne High School for replacement project which was priority number 22. It has been moved ahead of the two other high schools that is priority number 17 and 18 because we still do not have complete design funding for those two high schools. In the previous conversation, the chair, uh, the chair of the board is familiar, familiar with, uh, it was discussed in detail that the future of the capital program will depend on the recommendations that come out of multi-year plan. So any other changes will be made in the future capital improvement plan. The other additions to this capital improvement plan have to do with infrastructure need improvements. The systemic projects within priority 19 and 25 
and between 34 and 37 on the FY22 request did not receive state funding last year. So we are resubmitting that as part of our request for fiscal 22. In addition to that, we have added eight roof replacement projects from priority 26 through priority number 33. We have also added three projects because of the need and that's the sprinkler installation at Battle Mount Elementary School, fire alarm system replacement at Perry Hall High School, and mechanical renovation at Pinewood Elementary School. Also for the benefit of the board members, this document is an evolving document. It will be adjusted, modified, based on the input that we receive from state once we submit it. And this will still be updated based on the future recommendations that come out of uh, the multi-year improvement plan that is being prepared. In addition to this information, we had received questions from some board members and board chair. The responses to those questions have been shared with you. A lot of those questions pertain to my IPASS which is not part of the state submission, but we have provided the answer. Uh, board will be getting more updates on multi-year improvement plan in future. We have already provided two updates and there's a website for that. So this conversation today is for the state submission of the capital improvement program. Also, Chair Causey had asked us to provide historical data on all the previous submissions from FY 2015 to 2021, and links to those have been provided. And I'm going over the question here, um, which, which are not for my IPASS, and I do not. Uh, the other question was the status of air conditioning projects. Uh, all of the air conditioning projects are on a schedule and our construction team is working hard to expedite those projects. Uh, barring unfor unforeseen conditions from pandemic or some other issue, we expect to have all of those projects completed on time and hopefully somewhere around the spring of 2021. So with that, I'll be open to questions, and uh, Mr. Saris and I will try to answer as many questions as we can, and if we cannot, we'll get back to you later on. Uh, George, if I missed anything, please feel free to uh, add that. So far, so good, Pete, nothing to add. Okay. Thank, thank you, you, Mr. Dixit, and thank you, Mr. Saris. Um, and also, there are a number of additional questions that were asked and answered that are um, attached to, um, are they attached to board docs or to the uh, web page, Mr. Dixit? Um, my understanding is that all of the questions are part of the uh, board doc or George, do you know the response to that question? They'll um, be part of the website also later on. Ms. Yeah, Cotton, I don't... Yes, There's yes, Ms. Question. Dover. Those questions and answers are on the budget website page, and it's also included in the board docs uh, for this evening in this item. Thank you. I see that there now. Thank you, Tracy. Uh, board members, questions and discussion? I see uh, one hand. Ms. Rowe? Yes, Mr. Dixit, I noticed that there are some maintenance projects um, that are on the capital request and there was one uh, there's other prod other maintenance things that don't end up on the request and there was one school in particular that i had a question about and i wanted to know if you don't know this now that's fine but i wanted to know if you could give me a status on the um painting situation at hawthorne elementary school i know there was a process to deal with um, chipping and peeling paint so there's no exposure to lead. And I know that the school system had been in the process of that, and I just wanted to know if that was complete. 
Okay, I'll provide you the answer to that question, but most of the projects that are in this list are large amount projects. They qualify for capital projects. Uh, a painting project typically is part of our operating budget request, but I'll get you the final answer later on. Okay, thank you. That's the only question I have. Thank you. Ms. Mack? Thank you, Mr. Dixit. Um, Mr. Mr. Dixit, I have a question about Lansdowne. Um, as you said, and as is reflected on this document, the county gave us $15 million for planning and design. Can you provide an update of how much of that money has been spent and where we are with um, moving forward with a new Lansdowne? Thank you, it's a very good question. Uh, the design work is proceeding. We are in the um, in the advanced state of design. Uh, no construction funds have been allocated for that project. And as you look on your sheet, uh, unless we get new construction fund, even if the design is complete, which should be complete in, uh, I don't have the exact date in front of me, but sometimes in the fall, uh, or, or the early spring of 21, uh, and, and I can get you the final date on that, what, but, but there are no construction funds available at this point. So uh, all that I can say that we are proceeding rapidly with the design of Lansdowne. There is no delay on that. I, I have a follow-up question to that. Um, thank you um, very much, Mr. Dixit. If, if we have trouble getting the additional funds, how long does planning and design work stay relevant? Oh, that will be there for foreseeable future. Uh, the, the, change, the rate of change in codes and other things, it can be adjusted. the recommendations come out there, um, uh, the construction funding should be coming. But I don't want to mislead anybody here. Uh, unless state passes that Build to Learn Act and large sums of money start coming, construction of projects that are not included on this list for construction is not in next two, three, four years. It is further down the road. Whether it is 10 years, eight years, or 12 years, we don't know at this point. Anything that we say is purely speculative. All that we control is that complete the design on time, and design will be completed on time. And I guess just to reiterate my question, um, Lansdowne is on this list. I understand that the state funding is not there yet. Yeah. But would the planning and design that is taking place right now be relevant for five to ten years? If uh, worst case uh, scenario occurs. Uh, I don't know about ten years, but for five years it should be relevant. And for ten years with minor adjustment, it should be relevant. Thank you, Mr. Dixit. Ms. Pasteur and then Ms. Joes. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Dixit, I'm just going to preface this by saying, you know, I think the world of you, you have certainly helped, um, particularly with Summit Park, getting that project moving. And you probably, without being psychic, know which school I'm about to ask. And that is, don't even look at that list, because it's not on that list. And I just want you to know that I'm going to have to call you. You're just going to have to talk to me to help me understand how Millbrook Elementary School just is. And I listened to you answer Ms. Mack's question. And when I look at how long it will take schools that are on the list, those babies will be grown and have their own babies. And that school, 1967, same school. 
um, will still not have a new one. So I just need to talk to you at some point um, or someone so I can understand how I can advocate for that school and just what needs to happen and what kinds of conversations need to happen. I've had county executive delegates, council people come out and it looks a whole lot better. It looked a whole lot better this past year than it has looked for years. I understand, I understand, thank you. But it's still in need and we've seen other schools just going up right around it. And when we talk about equity as we did on that committee, and I, I can't get out of my head that I process the corner on which that school sits. And I realize that there are three different disenfranchised communities that are being further disenfranchised, having to have a cut and paste building facility. And it, it is a blessing that there are good people inside of that building who care about their children. But I am absolutely troubled by the fact that it's, there's not even a 41 squeezed in there. I just needed to put that in, but you're still the man. Thank you. Thank you for your kind words and thank you for the support and care you have for our children. Thank so, you. So to dovetail with Ms. Pasteur, um, in those conversations, uh, that is information that is important to the full board to understand how our resources are being applied um, equitably around the whole county. And it is unfortunate that um, Baltimore County was on a path of a great deal of improvement and now we have uh, been hit with an economic crisis and the, and the plans that um, everyone has worked so hard for are um, some of them are going to be on hold. So um, what is the, so I just wanted to put out there that when these conversations are had, just to uh, be sure and update the full board, please. We always do. Thank you. And Ms. Jones is next. And that I'm going to share as well. Thank you for saying that, Ms. Causey. We're not going to keep this in the closet. Mm -mm. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. Um, Ms. Jones. Thank you, Mr. Dixit. Uh, Mr. Saris, I see you over there too. Uh, my question is, I agree with what Ms. Pasture said. We have to make sure as a member at large that all our schools are equitably planned and not um, based on who cries the loudest. So I have seen facilities across the county that are in various states of disrepair. And, uh, you know, predominantly those are the disenfranchised and the economically uh, disadvantaged groups. So for me, that is a concern. And secondly, we're talking about um, the, the planning, the design money, and do you have separate dollars set aside for any kind of redesign that would be needed given that we are in the middle of a global pandemic and a possible recession that may come through if we have to set that design aside to redesign it to bring it up to the specifications and permits that may have expired. Uh, there may be a considerable amount of uh, redesigned dollars that may be needed to bring it up to code. Okay, so there are several questions in there. Uh, the first one was general comment, and that had to do about equitable facilities. So uh, as you will see, that as part of the plan that county is working on or supporting us, multi-year plan, there is a pillar for evaluation, and that's based on educational adequacy and equity. And that will. So when we finally rank the school, it is our expectation that equity and educational adequacy will be part of that evaluation. So that's the first answer. Uh, we are actively working on it. It's a totally transparent process. There are board members involved in that process, and there are community folks involved in this process. And the couple of uh, interactive session we had, uh, we had good conversation on that with the consultant. So that's the first part. The second part 
is about the design and redesign effort. As you know, that the design funds are 100% county's responsibility. So the county share of the project includes design funding, and they have been very supportive in providing those funds once we agree on the project. So while we cannot guarantee anything at this point, all that I can say that from the previous conversation with them, which superintendent's team and the county executive team meets on regular basis and discuss these issues with them. If the redesign is needed for a project that has been approved, uh, I'm sure that they will consider our request. But I do want to emphasize that we are at the benevolence of county and state fund. As much as we want to improve the facility, we in Baltimore County Public School do not have authority to raise funds. They come from the county or from the state. Did I answer your question? Yes and yes. no, but that's good. Thank you. Mr. Kuhn? Thank you. Mr. Dixit, uh, my first question has to do with basically following up on Lisa Mack's question regarding the amount of funds that have been expended for the Lansdowne um, uh, planning activity. And um, I don't, I, I'm not sure if you have a ballpark figure of how much we've spent. And if you do, please share it. If not, my question really goes to the total amount. If there are any funds left over from that $15 million of planning money, are you able to repurpose it, repurpose it to another project for planning money? Okay, so there are two questions. The total total approved amount is $15 million. Design is in progress. I don't have at this point exact amount of what has been spent. But once design is completed, most of that amount is going to be spent. If we have to repurpose those funds for that project or any other project, we have to go back to county. And in most of the cases, they, there are other projects that need additional funds. So superintendent's team and county executive's team, we meet on a regular basis to see where we stand on those dollars. And if there's a need in some other project and there's some surplus in one project, we try to balance that. But we still remain within the approved bond amount that county has. I appreciate that answer, thank you. My next question is specific to the fact that Red House Run Elementary has moved up. Now, <clears throat> I understand um, somewhat from the brief explanation that you've made. It is to make sure we don't have to move children from one school to another school to another. Um, that is what you, you shared with us. I guess part of my question or my main question is, you know, we've been told time after time that you don't want to move things around on this list because the state doesn't like it when you're changing priorities. And, and that's a challenge. So is this going to provide or uh, become an obstacle for them to provide us with funding for capital plan planning? That's, that's a very good question. I need to compliment you on that. Uh, we, yes, we don't want to change priority. We don't like to change priority. But in cases when it is of help to us, to board and to our kid and has efficiency uh, built in in that process where we can use our funds efficiently and we can justify it to you we can justify it to our fiscal partners in county and state and have a transparent process i think it's a wise thing to do as long as we don't do it for every project every year in this case if you remember the priorities for projects were based on uh, in a lot of cases on the need for air conditioning. Now, since we have air conditioned on all, all the schools, 
we have a little bit of flexibility in looking at the condition. So if you look at the condition of Redford, uh, Red House and Bedford, Red House is in worse condition than Bedford. The reason Bedford was higher because it didn't have air conditioning. That air conditioning will be completed now. And so if you mix that thinking with the enrollment issues, because for the Northeast cluster, they, they, right now the deficit is 617 students as compared to 225 students in the Northwest cluster. And we, when you look at the enrollment and go to 2026, there'll be a deficit of 904 seats in Northeast cluster, those two schools, as compared to 321 schools in Northwest. So the rationale is evident, it is transparent, and it can be shared with everybody. And that's the reasoning for doing that. If we don't do it, we'll have a lot of relocatables in several schools in the relocatable cluster. And board will be hearing from community members about the poor planning and why didn't we do something about it. And going back to the Northwest, there is not a long delay. If, you, if we just, it is just one year that we are going to adjust it in terms of construction time. Thank so you, I, sir. Yes. Anytime. Fine. My, my next question, question. Uh, okay. simply has to do with the number of seats. Um, is, is 700 seats just kind of like a placeholder? Like that's what we aim for when we're building a new elementary school? Yeah, from our experience, we have found that once you look at the delivery of instruction, once you look at the operational cost, uh, that size is just in the right neighborhood. Obviously, that number changes depending on the programs that we have in school. Each school has unique set of programs, and buildings are designed for the program. So in some schools, you may find it's 685. In some schools, you may find 735 but in the same vicinity in that area. So I, I know there's a lot of complicated issues surrounding all of this and I appreciate your answers. Um, but when we're looking at an area such as the Northeast where you're saying there's explosive growth, and we all understand that to be the case, wouldn't it be prudent to add and increase the size of schools that we're building there in order to sop up some of that excess that we're expecting? And, and that's a question that we have grappled with in the past. And the only honest answer I can share with you that larger schools seem to have impact on the delivery of education. If you, you, know, if you want me to prove it, I can't. But we have tried to be equitable in all neighborhoods throughout the city. So we, keeping that in mind, you will see that no matter what part of county we are building a school, we try to make same size so nobody gets the impression that we didn't treat them equitably. Thank you, Mr. Dixit. I appreciate your time. Thank you. I see Ms. Rowe again. Uh, before Ms. Rowe speaks for the second time, is there any other board member that has not yet spoken? Ms. Rowe? Hi, uh, Mr. Dixit, I just wanted to know that when you produce the pages that go into the gigantic phone book, as you like to call it, of that is the state request, will you be giving the board those updated pages? Because you know I like to keep them all and look at them and compare them and watch the state meetings. And so I would like to have those, if you don't mind, when you get to it. I know they're not complete yet. Yes, you will get a new book. It's, that'll be a totally new book. It won't be updated pages because each year there are different numbers for condition, enrollment, and community analysis. So you will get a copy of that. Board will get a copy of it. Thank you. Thank you. And the board will be evaluating and um, voting on this at our next board meeting. Um, so um, we can process anything additional. Um, I did just want to say I really appreciate 
Mr. Dixit and Mr. Saris, I feel like I've been on a marathon with you both over the last five years and was um, looking over some of the documents that we have discussed related to facilities. And um, I appreciate the additional answers and the questions and um, just would encourage uh, community members that are interested to look on board docs and review those additional questions. If there are any other questions that need to be asked, uh, we can do that in the next week or so. So unless there's any additional comment, we'll move on to the next item. Thank you very much, Mr. Dixit and Mr. Saris. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is board committee updates. And uh, for that, I will go around our uh, virtual dais and I will ask Ms. Pasteur to go first, uh, curriculum committee and also uh, legislative and government relations. Thank you. I'll start, um, well, let's see. I'm going to start with the uh, uh, government. Uh, under the leadership of, I'm sorry, under the leadership of uh, Councilman David Marks, a task force has been formed, uh, the Adequate Public Facilities Task Force. Um, this past year, uh, I think Ms. Rowe brought it up as a point of conversation, but Ms. Scott uh, and myself, we all have experienced, I think Mr. McMillian as well, we've experienced in our districts um, just enormous overcrowding of many of our schools, and mainly because we are finding that we have new developments that are cropping up and developers do know how to circumvent uh, policy, rules, laws, et cetera. And fortunately, the county council has joined forces with us because of the, um, the legislation that comes around this. What is our percentage of overcrowdedness? I would think that all of us are fighting it now. I'm in the middle of a battle uh, in my district right across from Woodhome Elementary. So we have, um, I believe it's 115% overcrowdedness before anyone says anything, and that is often uh, ignored. So the county council, again, under Councilman Marks, even though every council person is supporting this, is going to take a serious look at this situation uh, with uh, just a, a good group of people um, on different walks of life who can talk about this and what we're doing to our schools and how we can mesh the growth of this county. Ms. Hen, who is on the committee and, of course, the um, board's vice chair, is going to be our representative. But it will be, the meetings will be open to the public, it just in terms of viewing, of course, because it'll be virtual. So we'll be able to, to get involved in that. And I, we're all counting on and knowing that Ms. Hen will bring back the information um, from that task force, whatever we might miss as we look in, and that she will duly represent both sides of the county and will be in constant communication with our government committee. So thank you, uh, Ms. Hen, for doing that. We certainly appreciate it, and our children are going to appreciate it. Also want to thank um, Dr. McComas and the curriculum and instruction staff uh, for the work that they've been doing, not only get, getting us through the spring and summer and reentry, but in the middle of all that, keeping in mind that we need to 
uplift, upgrade our curriculum, that as we start talking about equity, there are things that we need to do to that end. So we're very pleased to say that um, our, our curriculum and instruction uh, personnel are doing an eighth grade social studies uh, pilot. And it is going to be very exciting because it is going to take a look at racial biases and it is going to have our young people start talking from their perspectives about what they're seeing and how we can make a change. And that's what school systems are supposed to be about, grooming our young people so that the change we will come through them, the changes that we all want. So thank you to all of you on staff working on that. Um, stay tuned for our September uh, curriculum meeting where we are going to share some, some tools, some technology tools uh, to help with this virtual learning. Also proud of the curriculum instruction people because they align themselves during this period with the new teacher project. And if you've not heard of them, please look them up so you can see the wonderful things that they do. Thank you, Mr. Williams, for um, helping them and, and supporting them in that. And I'm hoping that we'll be able to do some other things with. And let me say it again so folks can look them up, the new teacher project. So a lot of things going on there. Please pay close attention to what you see on the um, website so that you will keep abreast of what is going on. And I want to speak to this. Um, Ms. Causey and I have had occasion to talk about this and also with um, Dr. McComas. So I just want to let folks know about some of the things that are happening, some of the things about which you have asked. So know, number one, that for those who want to receive hotspots for student lessons, please identify your need to your child's school and let them know that you need that internet support. No qualifications are required. Baltimore County Public Schools is simply allowing for self-identification. The school completes a Microsoft form that was created by the Office of Title I uh, and input information about the student, including home mailing address. That information is provided to the hotspot vendor who will drop the device and in, drop and ship the device and instructions on how to activate that. So we do have just a large number of hot spots and we are willing and able at this point, if you will just let your school know that you are in need of a hot spot so that your child can get online and stay tuned in to the work that is going to be done. And I believe that's it for new information. Thank you, Ms. Causey. Thank you, Ms. Pasture. And the uh, next committee that we'll hear from is Building and Contracts Committee Chair, Julie Hen. Thank you, Mrs. Causey. There are no updates from Building and Contracts. Thank you. The next committee we'll hear from is Policy Review Committee, and I am the chair of the committee. And uh, the committee did not meet in August. Uh, the Policy Review Committee is scheduled to meet virtually on September 21st, 2020, beginning at 4.30 p.m. The meeting agenda and items to be discussed will be posted prior to the meeting at our website, uh, bcps.org slash board slash committee dash agendas dot html and there'll be a link in there to um, click in to for the community to watch the meeting
And the next committee for an update is Ms. Makita Scott, uh, Chair of our Equity Committee. Great, thank you so much for that, Kathleen. Um, Ms. Palsy, and basically we had our meeting um, on August 20th. Uh, staff members, Dr. Lisa Williams and Mr. Billy Burke um, and were in attendance and we went over our upcoming meeting dates, our mission statement, and we discussed our equity audit. And our we basically were able to um, come up with our mission, which um, I will share um, briefly. It's just that the uh, the mission of the Equity Committee of the Baltimore County Board of Education is to remove structural, cultural, and systemic barriers that lead to diminished opportunities for all BCPS students. That is the first sentence, or, the, or rather the first paragraph of our mission. I just wanted to share that. And also we um, discussed an equity audit that was done. And the equity audit was done, and I will share a little bit of that um, uh, with everyone because it was it was it was quite inclusive and it covered a, a large um, swath of um, various things. And basically in June, 2020, the equity committee held its inaugural meeting. This committee aims to address persistent patterns of inequity. One of the major outcomes of that meeting was the request for a system-wide student outcome trend data disaggregated by student groups based on race, ethnicity, and um, special service. And we examined where are student gaps, um, are there identified and persistent gaps, and are the gaps widening? So we basically um, heard from Dr. Lisa Williams and Mr. Billy Berg, who shared the data with us to show us where there were gaps, where they were widening, and it was across um, all areas, um, it, from elementary school, middle school, to high school. And out of that, uh, out of our meeting, we uh, made the motion and the request that this report come to the full board so that we can share it um, um, with um, all board members. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Scott. The next committee is uh, that we'll review is the audit committee and the chair is Ms. Lily Rowe. Thank you, Ms. Causey. The audit committee has not met since the last committee update. Uh, we have our next meeting on September 22nd at 4.30 p.m. Uh, the agenda for that meeting has not been set yet. At the last committee meeting, the committee had decided to open a process for the Office of Internal Audit to provide information to the board. Our administrative staff facilitated uh, the Office of Internal Audit's ability to provide information to the board via the weekly update. There is additional information in the form of reports that the board needs to receive. Um, an email went out from the law office with forms that board members need to sign in return. So as a just quick housekeeping update, if you would please review your July emails and follow the instructions from uh, the school systems law office. Thank you. Thank you to all the committees and the committee chairs for um, all of the work that continues. The next item on the agenda is item L, information. And um, we have attached to board docs, the revised superintendent's rule 3410, non-instructional services, transportation services, revised superintendent's rule 3420, non-instructional services, student transportation, bus route, and bus stops, revised superintendent's rule 4101, personnel, conduct, drug-free workplace. And all of those are attached to board docs. The next item on the agenda is announcements. The next board meeting will be Tuesday, September 15th at 6.30 p.m. And that can be accessed through our website. And Dr. Williams, did you have a announcement that you wanted to make in terms of? Um, sure, your... thank you. I'm, I'm sorry, Ms. Palsy. Thank you for the time. I do just want to make a quick announcement. In order to keep parents abreast of important information as appropriate, 
Schools will continue to provide updates to their communities with information that pertains to the operations of an individual school. This would include uh, meals, schedules, instructional materials, and other school-specific related information. As additional information becomes available regarding the opening plan, BCPS will continue to use our webpage, www.bcps.org, school messenger calls, and other forms of communications and media to inform all stakeholders of the updates. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Williams. And now the final, um, the agenda item that was added um, where we have uh, legal questions. May I have a motion to go into closed session as permitted by the Opens Meetings Act as found in the Annotated Code of Maryland General Provisions Article 3-305B7. Um, to consult with counsel to obtain legal advice. Do I have so a motion? Moved. Thank you. Is there a second? Is there a second? Second. Second. Thank you, Mr. Q. Uh, is there any discussion? Okay, hearing none, Ms. Gover, can Ms. I have a roll call? Ms. I have my hand up. Oh, I'm sorry, let's see. Yes, uh, Ms. Jones. Thank you. Um, Ms. Howie or, or Mr. Nussbaum, if you could clarify, because Rod's motion was to discuss this in open. We are not really going through a procurement soliciting or looking through different law firms. Can, does this have to be enclosed? It's a really a um, procedural question, or uh, can this be done in open? This is Andy, and I'll let, I mean, Ms. Howie can certainly talk too. It can it can be done in open, but it can be done in closed. If, if the board votes to close the meeting to obtain legal advice, it certainly uh, can do that. So the question is, there were legal questions, and the, the uh, board chair can recess for legal advice but if i would be the only one hearing that legal advice so in order for the full board to hear the legal advice we, it is necessary to can somebody into... mute their phone please thank you um <clears throat> so there were legal questions regarding this and as the board chair i can recess for legal advice but then only I can hear the legal advice. Uh, so in order for the full board to hear the legal advice and then proceed with uh, whatever action the board wants to take, um, we need to go into closed session to seek legal advice. Is there other discussion? Ms. Gover, can I have a roll call vote, please? Dr. Hager? Vote no. Yes. Mr. Kim? Yes. Ms. Pasture? Yes. Mr. Austin? Yes. Mr. Hamza? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Jose? No. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Chair Kathleen Causey and I am reconvening the open meeting of the Board of Education of Baltimore County for Tuesday, August 11th, 2020. Earlier this evening, there was an agenda item that was added to the board's regular agenda, and the board will process that agenda item at this time. Mr. McMillian, if you could please restate your motion. Certainly. 
and I like the simplicity of how it's stated. I move that the Baltimore County Board of Education solicit an RFP for board legal counsel services through the BCPS Office of Purchasing following appropriate procurement guidelines. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Second, Mr. Mahumza, thank you. Uh, board member discussion? I'm sorry, this is, I didn't mean to interrupt, but this is Andy Nussbaum. I just wanted to let you know I'm back. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, so, board members, is there discussion? Ms. Hen has her hand up. I'm sorry, Ms. Hen, thank you. Sometimes it scrolls by. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. I would like to offer the following friendly amendment. Um, I move to direct the Building and Contracts Committee to work with the Office of Purchasing to pursue. Oh regular and routine board legal services in compliance with federal and state statutory regulations and board of education policies, procedures, and rules. Second. Bro. Um, Mr. McMillian, yeah. actually, um, Mr. Nussbaum, in terms of Ms. Hens, a friendly amendment, how shall that be processed? Well, I mean, the, theoretically, there's no friendly amendments, but I mean, the, I think traditionally, if, if the, what, what this board has done is if the maker of the motion accepts it, then it's accepted. If it's not, then it's an, that's an, then it's an amendment that should be on the table and, and subject to vote. Okay. So, Mr. McMillian, in the interest of time, is um, that an amendment that you would accept? As I stated earlier, I like the simplicity of my motion. I do. I am not interested in accepting that motion. So that should okay. be treated as as a as an amendment that should be voted on by the body. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Newsbaum. Ms. Hen, could you please restate your motion? Yes. I move to direct the Building and Contracts Committee to work with the Office of Purchasing to procure regular and routine board legal services in compliance with federal and state statutory regulations and Board of Education policies, procedures, and rules. Is there a second? I seconded, Ro. Um, board members, questions? or discussion related to Ms. Hen's motion? Excuse me, Ms. Causey? Yes. Mr. Nussbaum, because Mr. McMillian did not accept the amendment, they are to vote on Mr. McMillian's motion no, now? No, it, it would be it would be an amendment. And it's actually, I'm not sure that it's an amendment rather uh, other than, I, I think it's more in the nature of, of a, a substitute motion, but that should be voted on first. Ms. Hen's motion should be voted on first. Thank you. I'm sorry, Mr. Newsbaum. Could you repeat that about the substitute motion? I'm not sure that it amends the motion. I think it it, it is a it's, it sounds to me like it's a new motion. It's a different motion than than the motion that was that was made. <clears throat> so should Ms. Hen rephrase her amendment to be a substitute motion? If Ms. Howie's still on, let me ask her, because she and I know most, knows much more about parliamentary, the, the intricacies of parliamentary procedure. Okay. So the motion that uh, Ms. Hen made does not appear to amend, but appears to be an entirely new motion uh, from Mr. McMillian's motion. So uh, I believe that because that motion is, is not amending, it's not adding to it. it, it is not subtracting words or substituting words. It's, it's a whole new concept. 
uh, that it's it's not in order at this time because the the assembly has not yet disposed of the motion that's on the floor. Okay, thank you. Um, so, Ms. Hen, in in terms of discussing the um, Mr. McMillian's motion, well, I see other hands that are up. I will come back to my question. Uh, Ms. Joes. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I want to thank Mr. McMillian for his motion because he brought a very important um, topic to the board. And your motion, I read through it. It looks like it encompass it. it includes everything. We are directing the Office of Purchasing to use proper procurement guidelines, and that is that includes all state laws and procurement laws. So I think it's complete in itself, and I I support it. So thank you. And I'm. I'm sorry, board members, but the uh, participant screen scrolls by, and so the names end up showing up in different order. So I'm not sure if I'm calling you in order. Um, Ms. Pasture, and then I saw Mr. Offerman, um, but then it went away. So, um, so Ms. Pasture, and then we'll process who's next. Ms. Causey, I have now forgotten what the question was. Thank you. Oh, I know what it was, but Ms. Ms. Howie clarified. I couldn't understand how uh, Ms. Hen's motion was really an amendment. And so I was going to ask that question and what it was that she was really saying. So I can still ask that part of it. What is it exactly that you're saying? Because I thought we were just both. Never mind, I don't want to convolute that. I'm fine, I'm fine. I'll listen to everyone else. Okay, and then Mr. Offerman? Yeah, I would okay. like to move the question. Um, I already have uh, another board member that had raised their hand, and I also had a question. Uh, is there a second, so I would not support that, but is there a second to um, second. Mr. Offerman? Molly. Uh, Thank you. Is there a discussion or just a vote? I believe it goes to I don't think there's Ms. discussion. Policy. I think it's just Madam a vote Chair. that needs two-thirds to pass. I'm sorry, Mr. Nussbaum. I couldn't hear you with some feedback. I'm sorry. I believe that you have to move straight to a vote, and it's two-thirds to pass. Okay, thank you. May I have a roll call vote, please? Dr. Heger? No. Mr. Kuhn? No. Ms. Pasteur? No. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Mr. Oh, Mahomja? Yes. Ms. Hen? No. Ms. Causey? No. Ms. Jost? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Mack? No. Ms. Scott? Yes. Ms. Rowe? No. Uh, okay, I just want to state for the record that there was so much back and forth. I was confused to what I was voting for. Were we voting? So I just need for my clarification. I know the vote is here. Were we voting for Mr. McMillian's motion? No, no. Ms. Pastor. You were voting to close debate. We were Mr. voting Mr. to what? We were, Mr. Offerman wanted to move the question to close debate. So the vote oh, was. Okay. All right. Thank to close you. Debate. Okay. I'm good. I'm good. I can exit. Okay. So, thank you. So just to clarify, Ms. Gover, that did not, that motion did not carry to close debate. That's correct. Okay. Thank you. So, Mr. Kuhn, your hand was up next. Okay. So um, my, my first question is, and I believe that Ms. Howie has already given us the um, the insight that um, Ms. Hen's motion is out of order, therefore we're no longer talking about that, correct? Ms. Howie? That is correct, sir. Yes, ma okay. yes ma'am. That is correct, sir. Thank you. So my only question that I have, because my understanding is what Ms. Hen just tried to do was to 
uh, make sure that the board was actually involved in the procurement and the RFP that's going out and the selection of the law firm is not going to be done by the um, uh, BCPS staff. It is going to be done no, by the board somehow. Yes. So my question is, how is that process going to work? Because that's outside of the normal process of them coming back with a selected vendor and saying, please approve this vendor. They don't come back with three vendors and say, which one would you like to pick? So how are we going to handle that process, if not within the building and contracts um, committee? Is there someone from procurement that can uh, respond to Mr. Kuhn's question? I do not believe Mr. Saris or Ms. Webster is on the call. Madam um, Chair, this is Daryl Williams. I can try to reach them when we dismiss them uh, for the recess. Let me see if I can reach Mr. Saris or someone from that team at this hour. I'm not sure. Madam Chair. Thank you. Yes, Ms. Hen. Thank you. I've been on two ad hoc committees that have um, worked with the Office of Purchasing on this process on other um, on the procurement of other services. So how it works is that a committee is designated to work with the Office of Purchasing to be the points of contact for this um, process and to manage it to rep make sure that the board's interests are represented. So the purpose of my amendment was just as Mr. Kuhn stated to ensure that the board is represented and that the process um, does work with intended because it is different than normal purchasing processes. So without that clearly defined, there is no stakeholder representation on the purchasing team as it will, um, or client, if you will, of the Office of Purchasing to go through this process. So that, to answer Mr. Kuhn's question, there still needs to be representation of the board in the process. So my amendment um, assigned that responsibility to the Building and Contracts Committee, which seemed to make sense. And why I proposed it is that Mr. McMillian is on that committee, um, as is the other member of the Building and Contracts Committee. An alternative would be to create an, a new ad hoc, but without having to go through that step of creating an ad hoc, this made sense that the Building and Contracts Committee could take this on as a project. Um, which was the the purpose of my amendment is to um, close that gap or to provide for um, board involvement in the process. So to answer Ms. Pastor's question, that was the purpose of my amendment, as well as to offer the board the flexibility to use other competitive procurement vehicles in addition to the RFP, because as I stated previously, the RFP is one acceptable procurement vehicle. There are others that are as acceptable. So, Ms. Hen, if I could a ask a clarifying question. So, if the board um, decided to, uh, through a, an appropriate mechanism in this meeting, to move this issue to the Buildings and Contracts Committee, one of the outcomes could be that it is an RFP. So, you would have that discussion in buildings and contracts with staff um, prepared to assist and and one of the and the process could end up being an RFP or it could be um, one of these other processes that you've mentioned correct okay um, so while dr. Williams is um, trying to reach procurement staff I see another hand and then it went away again miss Rowe did you have your hand up Yes, so okay. I'm, in light of the recent discussion, I'm concerned that the way Mr. McMillian's motion currently reads, without it including Building and Contracts Committee or any board committee facilitating and working with purchasing, it sounds like if we approve his motion that we're allowing the purchasing department to select our attorney. Ms. Can Charles, someone can I clarify? Say can someone clarify if that is the case or not? Because I don't think it's our intent or Mr. McMillian's intent, although I could be wrong, to allow the staff to select our attorney for us. So, Ms. 
Bro, uh, Dr. Williams is trying to see if there's a procurement staff person available to answer that, to answer our questions related to this. Um, Ms. Howie, did you have any guidance? So members of the board, uh, obviously through your building and contracts committee, you receive um, a wealth of information about the process and those individuals, those firms, uh, those uh, organizations that have participated in the process. And certainly you have the absolute right through the building and contracts committee to ask questions, uh, to um, inquire about uh, any sort of qualifications. So it's to conclude that this is staff's work alone is not um, completely accurate because obviously ultimately the board gets to look at those other firms and organizations that have also um, been part of the process. Uh, and it's up to uh, the board through the committee as to whether or not the recommendation would go any farther to the board itself or be returned to staff okay. for additional work. We okay. don't typically see multiple bidders in the buildings and contracts committee. So um, I did want to, excuse me, Ms. Rowe, I did want to make a, um, make a comment. So Dr. Williams is unable to um, connect with uh, procurement staff at this time. Um, so um, I'm gonna process through who else is left. I do have an additional comment. Um, Mr. Mahumza. Ms. Um, Ms. Cosby too, I, I had my, I asked to speak here after Ms. Rowe, but, but Joshua can go ahead and speak now. Okay, so so Mr. McMillian, you're not in where where I can see your hand. So thank you for letting me know. Yes, thank you. Yeah, uh, I think Ms. Howie basically answered it because I, I was kind of concerned with uh, Ms. Rowe's comment that uh, when she said that staff will be choosing an attorney, because my understanding is that this, uh, this only uh, tells staff to give us options and I think we get the final vote. I was just concerned with that comment, and I think Ms. Howie answered it perfectly. Well, Mr. Mahamza, I'm, I share your concern, and without procurement staff here, I'm not um, clear on the board approving an RFP, but the RFP has no who's designing the RFP, what are the, what are the criteria in the RFP, um, so that is a concern that I have about approving Mr. McMillian's motion. Um, so I think the process. That, yes. So I think that in general, sending it to Buildings and Contracts Committee, where they can have that full discussion with procurement staff um, who have spent time uh, preparing for it, um, would be uh, a, a better answer than requesting a, a, a specific path. Um, so we have Mr. Kuhn and then Ms. Mack. Uh, uh, Ms. And, uh, don't forget. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. McMillian. Mr. McMillian, go ahead. Okay. I just want to pull out of my motion through BCPS Office of Purchasing following the appropriate procurement guidelines. If I'm not mistaken, they go out and research the issue. They bring the issue back to buildings and contracts building and contracts, then votes on the issue. Then if they vote for it, then it goes before the Board of Education. Uh, the way that we're talking about it, if right now we've got 12 people on the board that is giving input in on this decision. If we slowly farm this out to the Building and Contracts Committee, there's going to be five or six people that can control this topic. I like the fact that all 12 of us are having Thank input you. on the decision that we're making. Thank you. I agree, Mr. McMillian. So in so, that case, I think what you're suggesting is a committee of the whole on this topic. Well, we're voting on, you know, hopefully we vote on my motion in a few moments and figure out what, which direction we're going to go. Ms. Causey, can Ms. I move back to the motion? Thank I'm you. sorry, Ms. Rue, what was that? 
Can I make an amendment to the motion? Um, no, I'm uh, at, at, at this time. I would like um, Ms. Hen to clarify for me. The committee of the whole, uh, rather than because I'm not seeing Mr. McMillian's distinction that going through the office of purchasing that brings it to the buildings and contracts um, makes it more accessible to the full board rather than the board sending it to buildings and contracts in the beginning to have the four board members from buildings and contracts with procurement staff that is there and prepared to discuss the options and then choose an option. So that again takes it to buildings and contracts versus a committee of the whole. Okay. Ms. Hen, are you yes. following me? No, but I, I am to an extent. So the importance here is that the board is involved from the start because we're talking about our legal counsel. We need to be involved in the process from step one, whether that's building and contracts, an ad hoc committee or a committee of the whole. If everyone wants to be involved, great. Let's make it a committee of the whole and get everyone involved so that everyone can define the requirements from the get go and not leave it to staff to guess at the requirements. We're not talking about staff legal counsel. This is board legal counsel. We should be involved in the process. If we approve Mr. McMillian's motion as is and hand it off to the Office of Purchasing, they are great at their jobs, okay? We know what we need in legal counsel. By excluding us from the process, we are cutting out the subject matter experts in the process, and we're not gonna be happy with the results. No matter how wonderful our purchasing office is, and they are wonderful, they need our subject matter expertise they are going to come to us anyway and say, what do you want? And if we haven't established the, the process and, you know, they're gonna to come to us and we're gonna be back at the same place be, having to make a decision of how this is going to work. So let's put it into one motion and decide the governance structure of how this project's gonna be managed because it needs to be managed and it needs board involvement. We can't hand it off and say, take care of this and do our jobs for us. It needs governance. And whether that's the building and contracts committee or committee of the whole, I don't care. Um, thank you, Ms. Hen. Um, I have seen, let's see, who has not, is there anyone that has not yet spoken that has their hand up? I don't believe I've spoken, Ms. Causey. Okay, Ms. Mack then. I think I'm mirroring what Julie just said. I, I'm new to the building and contracts, but since I've been on the building and contracts, we are given uh, we are given a contract that says these are the steps we took to choose this firm or to choose this company. We are not given an opportunity in building and contracts typically to provide input on what we even want as our board um, board council, and I think it's a very, very important position. And I think we should have input into it. And unless there is an amendment to Mr. Um, McMillian's motion, I wouldn't vote for it as it is. So Ms. Causey, if I may. Uh, yes. Just, and, and just a little bit about the process that I do understand because I have lived through it. The Office of Purchasing doesn't go off and make selection without getting criteria from the client, and that would be the board. So the Office of Purchasing would get all the criteria from the board first before it even undertook to start any sort of process. They are not going to assume that they understand what the client wants. When you think about the diversity of the school system and the type of services that and goods that we procure, the Office of Purchasing would need that subject matter expertise, would need to know from you what you want and what you expect. One, another possibility to be able to move this this evening is to postpone a vote on this motion until the process can be explained to the board, to the board satisfaction. 
So po postponed to a definite time would be the motion. It can be placed on a future board agenda under that sort of motion. Thank you, Ms. Howie, for that. Um, I do have uh, additional board members with their hands up. Um, Mr. Kuhn, and then uh, Ms. Joes. So, Mr. Kuhn. Thank you, Ms. Causey. Um, I'm just going to echo what Ms. Mack just said in building in contracts, which I've been involved in just by going to it. I'm not on it. Um, there is no, There are no options provided to the board. There's a selection made, and it's an up or down vote. So I just want to make sure everybody fully understands that. And if board members are not involved in this procurement, we are going to be handed our council, and that's ridiculous. We need to be intimately involved in selecting board council. Ms. Joes? Ms. Joes, if you're speaking, we cannot hear you. Oh, sorry, I was on mute. Um, Mr. We can definitely ask procurement to bring back more than two vendors or three vendors to choose from. I believe the procurement office will follow protocol uh, and go through what the board wants. So I, I think it's it's not true that the board just approves what comes to them because the building and contracts has rejected several contracts. Um, the stop arm recently was rejected by the building and contracts committee. So. It does not say that they're strong arming us. They, they, we can give them the criteria, certainly what we want. We want more than two firms to pick from. We want uh, firms that have specialty in education law. Um, I think Mr. Rod's, Mr. McMillian's motion is just putting it into place, initiating the process, and then we can fine tune it as a committee as a whole for the full board to be involved. Because I agree with Mr. Kuhn, uh, everybody should be involved in this process and not just four or five people. And Mr. Offerman? Mr. Joes, uh, raise the same point I wanted to raise. Thank you. Okay. And then, Ms. Mack, is your hand up anew? Yes, it is. Um, if that's the case, um, again, I want to reiterate, because I am on the Building and Contracts Committee, we, yes, we can certainly... Um, vote against contracts but we are not given input we are not given an opportunity in building and contracts to provide input and again unless there's an amendment to mr um mcmillian's motion that clearly states that board members will provide input i wouldn't vote for it and um Mr. Mahamza, your hand is up. Is that a new? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, because it's what Ms. Max is saying, and The board. No, it's not right. Okay. Well, and and Ms. Pauzy, can I make the amendment? Yes, and I, I I I would well, um, and we don't, Mr. Mahomes, and we don't have procurement staff here to clarify, so <clears throat> we don't uh, want to put words in their mouths. Ms. I Rowe, amend, please. I would like to amend Mr. McMillian's motion to add the language at the end to be facilitated by a board committee of the whole. Is there a second? Second, Kuhn. Is there any discussion? Yeah, can you repeat that again? Sorry, I missed it. So Mr. McMillian's motion, and I would like to add language at the end that says, to be facilitated by a board committee of the whole. Okay. Um, this is Ms. Scott. I just want a clarification so that I understand that it's, and again, uh, procurement staff are not here, but it sounded like what Ms. Howie was saying was that they would get the information from us as far as what we were looking for and then basically just 
facilitate it and then just bring us back um, the information. So, excuse me. So, basically, it sounds like what you're saying, adding that on to the end, abundant um, to the process that's already taking place. It's not and redundant. I just would like clarification on that. Ms. Howie, are you still on the line? It's not redundant because the current process. Excuse me, goes Ms. To is Ms. Howie still there? Because she spoke to that, so I wanted clarification from her if she's still available to let us know if that is indeed redundant or if that's something different. I'm still on the line, ma'am, and it would be, in parliamentary terms, a proper amendment to the motion. Oh, so thank you, Ms. Howie. So then is it still the same process? Does procurement still work with us to find out what it is that we want and then incorporate that in um, procuring, I guess, or, or bringing contracts to us? I'm sorry, ma'am. I, for one, did not um, hear your question, and I'm oh. also not sure whether or not that question was directed to me. Sorry, I was going by um, what you had said earlier, what Mr. Mahomza just spoke to in regards to you said uh, procurement wouldn't work in isolation, but they would work with us as the client to, I guess, get our input as to what we were looking for. I just wanted to get uh, clarification on that, or did I mishear that? That's what I'm trying to understand. No, ma'am, you did not mishear. That has been my personal experience when uh, my office has gone through the procurement process that so, purchasing must have questions that they ask prior to putting anything as they say on the street uh, they do not uh, they do not write anything until they've spoken to the end user until they've spoken to the client okay so then this motion then asking for the committee as so a whole be to be involved chair. sounds like the same thing that would already be happening on the front end but but that would ensure it and we wouldn't have to wait for staff. We would ensure that we would be given the opportunity to provide input. So but it if would staff were already getting our input, input. So basically, it would just we, they would. So basically, we would just do the same thing twice. So, Miss Scott, Miss Scott, this is Miss Causey. Um, the 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 there are processes that are followed in there's governance, and as Miss Hen has pointed out. Um, there are typical processes, and in the typical process, the Office of Procurement would not necessarily come back to the whole board. Um, so if the whole board wants to be involved in the process, then the Committee of the Whole is the only process that ensures that. Um, if the um, board members are comfortable with the Office of Procurement being give, given a task, and then it uh, solely goes to the Building and Contracts Committee, then that is the alternative. Um, I do uh, hear Chair. from Dr. Williams that he was Thank able you. to connect with um, Dr. Scrivens, who has rejoined us. And Dr. Scrivens, I want to thank you for rejoining us. Um, there's been quite a bit of conversation, and I would um, ask at this point, um, if Ms. Hen, since she is uh, the chair of buildings and contracts, uh, could put in front of Mr. Scrivens our discussion, um, and then um, we can have uh, other board members ask questions. I'm sorry, Madam Chair, this is Dr. Yes. Williams. There were several comments made about procurement, um, and, and so I was fortunate to get back staff to this open session to clarify the process there were several things that were made, uh, comments that we really are appreciative that Dr. Scriven is here uh, to provide some clarity about the procurement process. So um, uh, at some point, as you mentioned, he needs to clarify the process um, for the board members uh, about how do we go through this procurement, the RFP, that may be helpful since at the time of the discussion, no one from that office was available. Yes, thank you, Dr. Williams. And um, if I could have Julie outline, and then Dr. Scrivens can respond, and then uh, any other board member. Thank you, Ma Madam Chair, and welcome, Dr. Scriven. 
So the, the discussion that we are currently um, having is around the procurement of services for board legal counsel. And the process, as I'm familiar with it, um, involves uh, the Office of Purchasing working with the client, in this case the board, um, to firstly define the requirements for those services. And where I believe we are currently stuck is defining um, is in that first stage and defining who the client exactly is. Because we are a 12-member board, we were discussing um, whether it's necessary to define from a government point who the office of purchasing would work with. In my experience, the board has created ad hoc committee to work with purchasing. Um, we have also, so ad hocs have generally been the case. Um, I proposed in this case that the Building and Contracts Committee might be another group to work with purchasing on this particular procurement. Um, the board expressed the desire for full board involvement, working as a committee of the whole as the client. So there's this discussion around um, the definition of, of client and who would work with purchasing and how that would work. So that's the, the piece of the process so, I believe we were discussing right. that maybe you could shed light on for us. Thank you. Sure. So Office of Procurement would assign a procurement aid to work with the full board. It, it would be best for them to work with the full board because in working with the full board, they would get the full board of what the requirements that the board are specifically looking for for the agency which would ultimately uh, meet your ask. Um, once those requirements are uh, fully established by the full board, then our recommendation would be for you the RFP process uh, which would officially then uh, farm those requirements out to agencies that uh, would best be able to meet your need. And that's usually uh, a two-week process. Uh, uh, those agencies would submit or return uh, to that procurement agent uh, proposals. Um, with appropriate responses, which would then be able uh, to be uh, reviewed by the full board and the, in conjunction or in partnership with the procurement agent. And even if the board, even if you so desired, uh, you could have agencies uh, come in to actually give uh, presentations um, on uh, their proposals so that you could make uh, the most informed uh, decision as um, and this this would be our recommendation in terms of uh, what process um, you should follow after presentations if you opted to go that way then you could identify uh, the most responsible uh, vendor as a part of that bidding process. So that, that's what what we as a system would recommend. Thank you, Dr. Scriven. And and also as part of that selection process, I've I've been on ad hoc committees um, working with the team. They've it's been a flawless process. They they do a great job with it. Um, the ad hocs have also been involved in the actual scoring of the proposals. Um, the group has provided a rubric and individual members have have actually scored the proposals. So they, they've been very, I've had a chance to be very involved in that process and have felt very included. So I think with such, with a procurement as important as our legal counsel, that's that's something that this board would, would want to be, to have that same level of engagement. And what our discussion has, has surfaced is that um, it, all members want that same level of involvement and an input. So I, 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 go ahead. 
I'm, no, you I'm go. You go ahead, Doctor Scribbins. That piece, but I no, I would. I would just. I would get again only just revisit the importance of, of the full board playing a role so that every voice is captured in terms of what specifically you're looking for. It doesn't mean that you could know the other way as long as what those requirements were were mutually agreed upon by the whole board. Thank you, Dr. Scrivens. May, I, may I ask one more question of Dr. Scriven? Well, I have uh, yes, but then I wanted Rod to uh, be able to um, um, repeat what he had said was his last um, position with his motion, okay? Because that, that, that is what we're going to process yeah. next. The, the second um, item of discussion around Mr. McMillian's motion had to do with the specificity of the RFP itself as the named procurement vehicle. And a concern I had was whether or not the board was being too specific and directive to um, the Office of Purchasing in prescribing what procurement vehicles could be used when, the, for instance, the Building and Contracts Committee receives contracts that are procured through a number of different means, all of which are legitimate um, procurement methods. So could you comment on whether that particular method or whether the board could be prescribing an RFP process or if there are other methods of procurement, um, whether we should be, leave that open to suggestions or recommendations from the Office of Purchasing. Is my question uh, clear? The, 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 I'm sorry. Uh, you can go ahead and finish. I'm sorry. No, I'm finished. Thank you. Okay, the, the, the recommendation from a procurement standpoint in, in the said scenario put forth would be to go through the full RFP process. It, there, there's no part of the process is the, is the messiness of really uh, determining what requirements you're looking for. Um, it, it's almost like doing a root cause analysis uh, in terms of meeting your need. You, you, it's best to go through that process. Thank you. And uh, I know there are other board members with their hands up, but I wanted Mr. McMillian to um, um, share with Dr. Scrivens and again the board his motion and his uh, most recent. Um, I believe, Mr. McMillian, you were just making a change to it, but I don't think we'd finished that before Dr. Scrivens came. So, Mr. McMillian. an amendment on the floor, too. Thank you for that. Uh, Mr. McMillian. I'll read my motion again, and then I have a comment about Ms. Rowe's amendment. I move that the Baltimore County Board of Education solicit an RFP for Board Legal Counsel Services through the BCPS Office of Purchasing following appropriate procurement guidelines. Thank I you, Ms. Accept, I accept Ms. Rowe's amendment. Ms. Howie, if you can, um, if you can just confirm for me that that's, um, that that's sufficient for Mr. McMillian to accept the amendment. It's the, the motion has been exhaustively discussed. The amendment should be voted on separately. <laughs> okay, thank you. So, Lily, just state your amendment and then we'll vote on it. Uh, to add language at the end of Mr. McMillian's motion that says, to be facilitated by a committee of the whole. And who was the second? Kuhn. I don't recall. I was. Mr. Kuhn, thank you. Okay, um, Ms. Gover, can we have a roll call vote on that, please? Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Fester? Yes, yes, yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Mr. Mahonza? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Clausey? Yes. Ms. Joe? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Mack? 
Yes. Miss Scott. Yes. Miss Rao. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. The motion carries unanimously. Um, now, board members, we're going to vote on Mr. McMillian's motion as amended by Miss Rose amendment. Miss Gover. Dr. Hager. Yes. Mr. Kuhn. Yes. Ms. Pester. Yes. Mr. Offerman. Yes. Mr. Mahomza. Yes. Ms. Hen. Yes. Ms. Kazi. Yes. Ms. Jones. Yes. Mr. McMillian. Yes. Ms. Mack. Yes. Ms. Scott. Yes. Ms. Rowe. Yes. I move to adjourn the meeting. Second. Aye. Um, first, the motion carries. And Dr. Scrivens, we appreciate you coming back to the meeting. And we appreciate uh, that uh, you and your team uh, will be helping the board process this. Um, yes, ma'am. It was my pleasure. I, I, am I uh, free to leave at this point? Hopefully I would say yes. <laughs> I would say yes. And thank you, Dr. Williams, for uh, for making that happen. I thank you, Dr. Scriven. Thank you, Dr. Yes, sir. Scriven. Thank you. thank you. Thank you. Stay safe. So we, the board officers and Dr. Williams do try to uh, have the agenda prepared and staff prepared um, so that things can run smoothly and board members can have the information they need. So I really appreciate Dr. Williams um, pursuing this so that the board could finish this at this point. So now we have Ms. Rowe with a motion to adjourn and Ms. Pasteur with a second. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, Ms. Gover, can you take the roll call vote? Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Pasteur? Yes. Mr. Rothman? Yes. Mr. Mahamza? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Kazi? Yes. Ms. Jost? Yes. Mr. Lord. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night, Good night. Take care and stay safe. Good night.